the mission of a deeper south has been taking the fragments of our collective memory insofar as they exist as a collective and trying to put those back together and as a friend of mine put it the other day looking backwards honestly is a very is essential to looking forwards that before we look forwards we have to look back and that involves not just our larger history as a nation and as a region but also at a personal level and a deeper south is largely about the work of memory and um i think the story that we're gonna share with you today touches on this issue in a lot of ways and i hope that we can have a really um fruitful conversation after this uh, i know john wanted to say a couple words too before we get started and i'm going to let him tell you um the the selma story from the beginning and um i just before i hand it over to john i just want to thank you all for being here and for being willing to spend your lunch hour uh or your breakfast hour uh, with us so john yeah pete and i talked uh before this about what we would say sort of as a preface to acknowledge the the weightiness of the moment that we're in um and we didn't share with each other what we were planning to say. He said uh, what was on my mind and heart. So I'm gonna, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and hop into the story. Uh, to do the just story justice is a solid 20 minutes or so. Um, it's a lengthy story. Uh, and we have some visuals to, to look at with it, but the resonance of the story for our present moment will, will be hard to miss once we get into the details of the story. Um, and certainly I think there'll be plenty of things to say about the story and reflection once it's kind of out there. So this was uh, two summers ago, so it's 2018. It was a Wednesday morning in July, and it was already at least 90, and uh, already, I mean, it was, it was super humid. I had actually been to Selma about a month before with uh, a group of eight college students. I did this uh, study way class called Civil Rights in the Deep South. And so we, we'd been to Selma, spent the night in Selma, um, walked the first mile essentially of the Selma to Montgomery March. Um, if you have not been to Selma, the Edmund Pettus Bridge today looks exactly like it did in 1965. It's a, it's a total timepiece. So in some of these sites you go there and, and the, the, the um, Sites, sites are very different from what it used to be. In this case, it really is like a timepiece and you're, you're, you feel just the immediacy of, of uh, 1965 when you're there. But anyway, so I had been with students about a month before, um, but we didn't know about this cemetery that, uh, <clears throat> it is Live Oak Cemetery, is that correct? Okay. Um, we didn't know about the cemetery, like the main cemetery for Selma. And so I guess either cousin of Pete's or just a contact in Alabama had, had recommended that we visit it. And uh, so we drive in about nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning in July. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. I mean, just, just beautiful place. Like in all the kind of you know, stereotypes and cliches you can think of, magnolias, live oaks, Spanish moss, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful space. So drive in, it's huge and it's very, very old um, and very, very wooded. And so we sort of drive into this, this sort of central road that runs through it. Um, and then we just turn down this, this um, either dirt or gravel road in, into the cemetery. And we're going down and at least in my memory, it's sort of magnolias on either side. I don't know if that's actually correct, but, but felt very ceremonial and, and dramatic. And we're going into kind of the heart of the cemetery. And um, we're seeing as we get closer, there's this, um, well, from a distance, we just thought it was a grave. Um, significant mo monument uh, ahead of us. And we get, we get closer and that's where the town's primary Confederate monument is. So it's, this, it's called Confederate Circle. It's this huge monument that that's just you know, dominates the circle. 
And so we get out and we're sort of taking that all in. And it was intriguing to us because um, traveling around and especially like the small towns where the built landscape sort of the center of it is so obvious. Usually these monuments are in the very center of town, like the, the in front of the courthouse, right there on the main street. So it was, you know, we were, we were curious about why this was um, in a cemetery and not, you know, on one of the main streets of Selma. So we're taking that in, sort of speculating on that. And then we notice, um, yeah, there you go. So then we notice this clearly much, much newer monument that's, that's in the same circle, but sort of um, down to the, to the left of this massive monument, but in the same circle. And it's a bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest, who we can talk a little bit more about him uh, later, but, or I mean, I, I guess, you know, so he's a, um, he had been a, uh, involved in the, the trade and enslaved people in the antebellum era, made a lot of money off that in Memphis, um, then was a Confe Confederate cavalry leader. And then after the war, he became in its early phase, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, which was established in 1866. We actually went to the town in Tennessee where it was established to overthrow um, with violence the Republican Party in the South. And um, so he's, he's not just any old Confederate general. He's, he's got a very, he's a very loaded figure. Um, and so there's this monument him that again, the, the one in the center of this, you know, that Pete just showed you, it's obviously late 19th, early 20th century. It's, you don't need to see the date on that to realize it's old. But there's this one that, that of him that's, you know, it seems like it had been up last, last week or so. And so we're taking that in and it describes him as, you know, it's got a number of things about him and it notes that how he was wizard of the saddle. Yeah, there you go. Um, which was a name he got as a cavalry commander for his horsemanship. But obviously, as he goes on and becomes Grand Wizard of the Klan, that has a obvious double, double meaning there. Then if you look down at the bottom of this, it's got the Confederate States of America's national motto, which you can translate alternately with as uh, God will vindicate us or with God as our defender. So this is, again, to see these uh, in the context of the late 19th, early, early 20th century was not that surprising, um, like to see them still in the landscape, things that went up then. But to see a new monument that was this bold, um, we were just sort of processing this, taking it all in. Anyway, so Pete and I, to, to process that, we, we did what we sometimes do on the tours, sort of went in our separate directions. Uh, Pete went over to sit under a tree and write down his thoughts. Um, I guess I went back to the van to get a camera. And anyway, I'm back in the van and a uh, <clears throat> town car, sedan, something like that, <laughs> pulls up and uh, there's a late middle-aged white woman, rolls down the window and says, can I help you? In this, this tone of thinly concealed hostility and suspicion. And uh, I was like, oh, we're just, uh, we're just taking some pictures, uh, <laughs> just traveling around. Uh, and she, she gets out of the car and still has this, this tone of kind of, yeah, thinly veiled hostility and suspicion. And um, says, well, I'm Pat Godwin. I'm president of chapter 53 of the United Dollars of Confederacy. And uh, welcome to our cemetery. And I thought, okay, so. <laughs> Um, so I'm sort of processing this uh, internally, what, what do I say? And, you know, if she's, anyway, what, what do I say? So I deflected to my, I'll just, I'll just be the history professor and um, ask a, a history question. And we won't talk about sort of, there's no point in debate about, about race or politics if she's president of the, that chapter. And so I just say kind of naively, um, <clears throat> is, is Edmund Pettus buried here in the cemetery? <laughs> and at this point, I just knew his name was on the bridge. That's all I knew. Uh, Pete knew 
some other things about him or later discovered some other things about him, we can get into that and that adds meaning to the story. I just knew his name was on the bridge. I could assume he was a US Senator, governor or something like that from Selma, right? Um, white man of the late 19th, early 20th century would have been my guess. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll walk you over there. <laughs> so it turned out it was almost at the other end of the cemetery. And so we start walking and, um, you know, again, it's hot, we're sweating, this kind of stuff. We're walking along and she's, she's making little comments here and there about, um, you know, how this, how this, the, especially the graves marked with SCV markers were not well kept by city crews uh, doing, doing cleanup. And then she says, you know, now the, the forest monument was in front of the Smitherman Museum, but the NAACP, right, after two lawsuits, they made us move it here. I thought, hmm, they, <laughs> there's, there's stories here. And then I, I had, you know, again, I'd just been there a month earlier with students. <clears throat> the mayor of Selma in 1965 was a young man, uh, I think he ran a furniture store, if I'm remembering right, in Selma, named Smitherman. And in a very infamous moment captured on, on just TV news, um, he makes this, this, I mean, you can look it up, I'm not gonna repeat it, what he says about Martin Luther King, just in a, in a press conference. So he's not just any old guy, he's, he's the, um, you know, unabashed segregationist mayor of Selma in 1965. She makes reference to the Smitherman Museum. I'm like, I wonder if that's the same Smitherman. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was mayor for like 40 years. I was like, he was? Because <laughs> he was a young man in 65. And uh, it turns out he was mayor until the year 2000. And so when we hear Selma, I think in the, the kind of dominant memory, it's often um, ultimately a heroic moment, ultimately, that leads to the Voting Rights Act. Um, but then I thought, you know, he, so he kept getting reelected for another 35 years. Um, that makes this whole story of Selma, the Voting Rights Act, less heroic. Clearly the politics at the local level um, didn't, didn't change in a generation or so. So I'm sort of processing that and, and we get over the Edmund Pettus grave. It's not particularly uh, noteworthy or remarkable. Um, and then we start walking, walking back at this point to the direction where, you know, Pete was still sort of in around Confederate circle, walking back in his direction. And uh, I start asking her some other just sort of history questions about Selma. And she's, she's like, Oh yeah, Selma used to be, uh, you know, it was a great place. Now it's all boarded up. I call it Plywood City, right? It's just all boarded up. And again, if you've been to Selma, the the, the poverty and kind of abandoned disinvestment in the in the town is is hard to miss. Um, you you just again hard hard to miss. Um, there's some magnificent older buildings. A lot of them are vacant. A lot of them are boarded up. And so again, I'm still sort of playing. I'll just ask history questions. And she's like, and I say, well, you know, when did, um, when did sort of the decline start? She's like, oh, around the year 2000. And I'm thinking, you know, the, the, the things that have affected, and Pete and I have been through many, many small towns in the South and even small cities. And, you know, when an agricultural population declines um, over time, the town feels the pangs of that and, and starts its own decline, unless outside industries are, are lured in. So it wasn't uncommon for us to see towns that were 50 years past their, their heyday. And I thought like 2000 is a real <laughs> recent time for decline. Then it comes out that in the year 2000, Selma elected their first ever African-American mayor. Um, and she's revealing this right as I think at this point we 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 can reconnect with Pete if that's if that sounds about right with the conversation. And uh, what was the first thing she said to you? There, there's more, much more to say about the conversation with Pat um, as the three of us got in the conversation. What was the first thing she said to you? I think it was, "Are you from the South?" Was that the first comment? Oh, yeah. Sorry. This is why it's helpful to have yeah. two storytellers. Yeah. 
the very first comment to me after getting out of the car and before introducing herself was, um, you know, she was looking at me like, what are you doing in this cemetery at Wednesday, Wednesday morning in July? And I said, I said, oh, you know, we're, uh, it's, uh, you know, with friend, my friend who's over there, you know, we're photographers and he's a writer. He's writing a book about the South. She's like, oh yeah, yeah. Everybody's writing about this book about the South, right? especially nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that was the initial comment yeah. to me. That's when I launched it into, let me just ask about the grave of Edmund Pettus. Anyway, back to that. So she, yeah, so she knew in her head that, that he was the writer writing a book about the South. Um, yes, yeah, so her first question to you was, are you from the South? I think and, it was, yeah, I think she said, so are you from the South? And I said, yeah, and, or yes. And she said, born and raised. And I said, actually, you know, I think I mentioned after she said where she might have asked me where in the South I was from and I might have, you know, I said Atlanta and I'm not sure that satisfied her question, but uh, she then said born and raised. And I said, yeah. And she asked me that again. And I felt like I was, you know, having to present my kind of Southern bona fides card or something. Um, but that was, you had already been with her for a good 10 minutes up to that yeah, point. Yeah. And that was my first introduction to her. Yeah. So, yeah. And then she, uh, yeah. So at this point we're, we're, we're walking back to Confederate circle, the three of us together. And um, she tells us a little bit more about, about how the forest monument, which her chapter was behind its creation um, how it got moved. And so it was the local NAACP, um, well, it was installed in front of the Smitherman Museum, which was actually city property, named, again, named for the, for the mayor, um, about three months or so after someone's first African-American mayor was elected. So it wasn't just, oh, let's, let's, <laughs> it's the year 2000, let's remember Nathan Bedford Forrest. I mean, the political symbolism is, is hard to miss. Um, but ultimately, because it was city property, that museum was, um, the NAACP was able to get it removed from the city property. And so it was moved to Confederate Circle, which within the city cemetery, the UDC actually owns the circle <laughs> and maintains the circle. Mm -hmm. the, the, the cemetery is city property, um, so they could have it there essentially on private property. The only access to the private property is through public property, et cetera, right? And then she starts telling us about, is Rose Sanders, am I remembering the name yeah, correctly? Rose right. Sanders, that's right. Rose Sanders, she has this radio show. I call it Hate 105. She just hates white people, hates white people. And Rose are people, they got together and they sued the city and da 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 and here we are and had to get moved here and da da da. So by this point, we're back in the circle, and um, Pete and I are about to say, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna head on goodbye." And we hear this um, at a, at a distance. We hear this large tour bus pull up. It's way back on the on the paved road that goes through the middle of the cemetery. So again, we had we had come down this this gravel or dirt road in the Confederate Circle. But there's a paved road that runs through the middle of the cemetery. Again, a distance at that point of a quarter mile. I mean, it's a significant distance. Mm -hmm. The bus is too large to pull down into the cemetery, so it just stops at the at the on the paved road. And so, and and it just sits there for a moment, and then the door opens, and a group of basically teenagers, at least initially, begins to. Uh, get off the bus. They're an in, uh, interracial group of teenagers, and there's an older African American woman with them. And so Pat immediately says to us, "Oh, those must be Rose's people. They bring them over here from the voting here rights. They come. Here, they come. here they come." And so Pete and I just kind of stand there, and it alternately felt like it, it felt like about two hours transpired. <laughs> 
as they begin walking down, you know, they're, they're sort of looking around the center, they begin walking down the road towards Confederate Circle. And Pat approaches um, to, we're not sure what was gonna happen. If a bolt of light, and again, it was sort of a you know, bright blue sky. If a bolt of lightning had struck down at that moment, it would have, fit, I mean, the, the tension was just palpable. And Pete and I were just kind of standing there, not even saying anything to each other, just sort of taking it all in, like, <laughs> just the intensity of Southern history is like, you know, it's just right here in the cemetery. And um, ultimately after what's, again, what seemed like two hours, um, in reality, it was, it was probably 15 seconds, but it was just such a weighty moment. Um, the group approaches and Pat says, well, hello, Joanne, to the, to the uh, middle-aged African-American woman. And Joanne is like, hello, Pat. And then Pat says to the students, well, where are y'all from? And they say, Washington, D.C. And she says, oh, Trump's town. And there's like this audible rumbling and kind of moaning in the group. And, and then she says, uh, well, I'm Pat Godwin. I'm president of chapter 53 of the United Dollars of Confederacy and welcome to our cemetery. And then she walks back to her car, <laughs> gets in, turns it on, drives, and actually makes a loop around the circle slowly and then drives out. And we're, Pete and I are just standing there. Again, we're sort of at a distance, but having heard all this, thinking like all, all this stuff just, I mean, so much, there's just so much weightiness in all of that. And um, we still stand there kind of lingering. By this point, Joanne, you know, and the students have, are, are fully in the circle. And Joanne begins telling them some of the history that we've, we've you know, just picked up recently from Pat about the um, politics in Selma, the, the, the transformations in the year 2000, um, the Battle of Symbols, and you know, it was from her that we learned that um, three months after Selma's first African American mayor was elected, this monument UDC puts this monument up at the Smitherman Museum. Um, anyway, Pete and I are lingering there again, not talking to each other, thinking like, how can we and should we even? Is it even appropriate to try to convey like? we're with you, <laughs> we think she, you know, like, we, you know, like, but is that even appropriate? Um, or is that, you know, should we just sort of wave and, and leave, right? Anyway, so, so we're sort of lingering and then we're like, oh, let's, uh, it, it, let's we get in the van, but we're still kind of sitting there. And um, she, Joanne just gives the students time sort of, write down their reflections. So they kind of disperse in different areas. There's probably about 25 students or so, something like that. And uh, anyway, one of the students sort of approaches, and he's not really walking towards us, but he sort of moves in a direction near our van. And um, he's African-American, I guess 14 or 15, something like that. And um, I guess we wave, I don't know how, we made eye contact. And he, he walked over a little bit and I said, you know, hey, you know, and it turns out they were, um, you know, a school group from DC that's basically doing, you know, hitting the road and seeing civil rights sites. And so that day they were with the Voting Rights Institute that Joanne was, we learned, later learned was one of the founders of and, um, she does these tours of kind of civil rights sites in Selma. And I said, oh, that, you know, that's, that's great that you're doing that. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's so cool that you're doing that at the high school level. Um, I was just here with some college students, but like I didn't do any, you know, I didn't do stuff like this in high school. That, that's really, really cool. Um, and then we, we talk a little bit more. 
more students start coming over. <laughs> By this point, like we get out of the van and we're, we're talking, we're showing them our, here's our relatively new Instagram page, follow us on this, and it's called Deeper South. And I don't think we had the swag yet, that I'm the swag, um, but we're telling them about it. And they're like, yeah, that's really cool, that's really cool. And some students are looking at us like, are those dudes okay? Like, <laughs> and um, Joanne approaches and we're thinking, you know, I mean, if she's hostile to us or assumes that we're with Pat and is critical like that, you know, that would be understandable. She approaches and just nonchalantly says, whew, you know, it's hot out here. Let me get, <laughs> let me get in the shade. And, and sort of leans up against the minivan and um, it, again, it was really hot in the morning. And then looks at us, she's like, no, no, what are y'all doing? <laughs> and um, in this just kind of nonchalant, hospitable style. And um, we ended up talking to her for a little bit and um, about some of her showdowns with Pat, um, about the tour she does through the Voting Rights Institute. And, I ask her a little bit about sort of things in Selma today in terms of just, you know, what people think of when they think of Selma in 1965. And then, you know, we were like, well, you know, we'll head on. And so Pete, Pete and I hit the road and, and um, head on to, I guess, on, further on into the Black Belt West. Um, later, the last summer, we, we ended up, um, getting a personal contact with Joanne, because there's, there's a great podcast called White Lies. If you haven't heard it, highly, highly recommend, and, and very pertinent for our present moment in 2020. Excellently done. Uh, it's two Alabama guys, and both Pat and Joanne are very much characters in the podcast. Uh, it had not debuted in 2018 when we were there, but but, the guys had been recording them. Uh, I think it deb debuted in spring of 2019, if I'm remembering right. Uh, we went, met one of the two guys and he, had, he just gave us Joanne's cell number. We called her, ended up having coffee with her um, last year. And uh, it was just this cordial hour long conversation. She of course remembered who we were. <laughs> and she was like, you still got that god awful minivan? We're like, ah, we've, we've got a cooler car now. There's a logo on it, et cetera. Um, but I think for, for, for Pete and I, just thinking about the, that encounter, uh, like in these two people, we had sort of different Souths represented. And so Pat was just fully just the conf a certain version of the Confederacy, right, 100%. Um, and in the person of Joanne, in just such an obvious way, the civil rights movement was represented. So we later learned that when she was 11, she was actually in the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, we also later learned, Pete learned this, that um, Edmund Pettus was not only a leading politician in Alabama, but had been Grand Wizard of the Klan in Alabama, which surely uh, anyone marching in 1965, they would have known that. We just know his name because of the civil rights march, but they would they would have known that. And again, that there's a there's a lot of meaning in the the symbolism there. But I think the, the biggest thing for Pete and I, and this is where I'll wrap up the story, is um, you know, if if Joanne had approached us and been skeptical, skeptical or hostile, um, seeing us with Pat Godwin in Confederate Circle, <laughs> that would have been totally understandable, right? It would have been, we would have expected that, right? Um, on the other hand, two white Southern guys in the Confederate circle on a hot July morning, um, we would have expected Pat to be, oh, this is great. Here are two young Southerners soaking up their, their Confederate heritage, right? And what actually played out was the exact opposite of that, right? So, so I mean, from the get-go, Pat was, was hostile and skeptical um, and remained that way throughout. Um, Whereas Joanne, it was just this nonchalant hospitality, which again was, was undeserved and uh, very much unexpected. There are little details on the story that I'm, I know I've forgotten. And it was actually the beginning of this crazy 48 hours that ended up uh, 
at the top of a repurposed fire tower in a place called Perry Lakes Park outside of Marion, Alabama, with three people we just met in the middle of the woods <laughs> at tree level. I mean, to totally like surreal. Um, but that's the, that's the gist of the Selma story. Uh, we found it, yeah, just weighty with the, the symbolism. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I think, redemptive in the human encounters that we had. I'm, I'm sure Pete has probably some details to add. There are some visuals we can add and, and Yeah, the, the only detail I would but, add uh, is, um, I mean, there are a lot of other kind of small finer moving parts of that story but you i mean the only one i'm thinking of now is um joanne when she got off the bus i mean she carries a certain gravitas um and i i just remember that sort of almost like a procession towards this monument and for a long time, I think we just knew her as Joanne. And speaking, you know, referring, going back to last week, we were talking about personalities, histories containing multitudes. Um, I only learned her last name. I think it was the following March, 2019, when I was back in Alabama uh, in Marion for a week. And I visited the Lowndes County Interpretive Center, which is a, a site along the um, Selma to Montgomery route on US 80. And uh, they have a film in there. It was very important during the, uh, during the march, the, the march. And um, there's a film in there about the Selma to Montgomery marches and kind of the role of Lowndes in, in that story. And Pat is in the film, but then Joanne, and I knew Pat's name because she told us, and she's not one who's ever been bashful about attaching her name to, to her cause, but Joanne appears on the film too. That was the first time I learned her name and then learned later that she had, you know, had been as a native Selmian and had been, as John mentioned, on the bridge, on the Pettus Bridge in uh, March uh, 1965. And, um, and I think one of the things that, the themes that that speaks to, which is, um, we've talked about a little bit before, is this idea of like, you know, not, you know, the, the, the encounter with that story, with that personality, and opening up onto another world um, where there's just tremendous depth um, is was kind of a wonderful accidental disclosure. But I think, you know, I'd love for us to talk about, and we can go back to some of these details maybe, but I think a couple of things were for me really jarring about this experience some in a positive way and some in, I mean, the, the most jarring thing was you basically, you know, I think we both felt like we were witnessing a confrontation of completely opposed views of everything. I mean, and a, a particularly all crystallized around this one controversial figure, around this one monument that has its own story, as John outlined. And I think at one point, we both sensed a move, again, there's a theme we've talked about too, a move from being an observer to that interaction, to being an actor in it, and to being a participant in that drama. And I, I don't think it occurred to me until a good bit later that um, you, what it must have looked like to the, this bus load of kids, mixed race, 
um, I mean, a racially mixed group and that there are these two white guys with beards and, you know, hanging out, talking to the president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And, you know, I sometimes wonder, like, what did Joanne tell those kids on the bus? And what did she have to prepare them for that we never would have thought of? You know, did she have to warn them that these guys might be reenactors or, so, or, you know, they might be sort of um, sympathizers, part of Joanne's, I mean, uh, Pat's kind of fan club. Um, so at one, at one level, it gave a sense of exposure to another perspective and being able to see ourselves both in this moment in Selma and, and as two white guys who fairly casually just conduct these tours around the South without thinking about this kind of stuff, without thinking about where it's safe to go or where, you know, where it, um, how you might appear. And that was a real, um, a real revelation to me that I think affected both the, you know, my understanding of that experience and my understanding of the experience or the, the activity that we, you know, for, I think for a long time have done, the, the things that we have done on these tours without really thinking about ever. Um, I, uh, I want to reiterate John's remark about white lies because of the, if you need a um, an amazing the white lies is about the murder of James Reeb, who was a uh, was a Unitarian, I believe, minister who was murdered in Selma uh, during the marches, and um, it's about that has for a long time been a very mysterious. Um, case. And uh, in Selma, it's, there's a lot of people who are still not ready to talk about it. Um, but Pat appears in there, and so does Joanne. So if you want a kind of deeper dive into some of that, I highly recommend that. Um, so I was going to throw it out there and throw it open to other people because I, I, I do feel like this story touches on a lot of issues that we're all, you know, we're all surrounded by right now in a way that we can't, um, can't avoid. Um, and I feel like that's, that's a good thing that we can, you know, have a frank on this conversation about that. So if you have a, a thought or want to jump in, unmute yourself. And my dad's over there, so I'll unmute him. Or you might have to unmute yourself. I, I know I shouldn't <laughs> say anything probably, but the first question that came to my mind was, was the fact that Pat was there a total coincidence, or did she know that Joanne was bringing this group there? I mean, it's just... It, you know, the coincidence is stifling. Yeah, she she seemed genuinely, she, she didn't seem like she expected them. Um, but Pete and I later thought, Pat must patrol Confederate Circle regularly. <laughs> and I think even if I'm remembering the detail in the, in the podcast correctly, I think that's how they meet her as well. Um, maybe maybe I'm wrong on that, but yeah. we, we feel certain that she patrols it. Maybe there's a camera there that's hidden. I don't know. It, it did seem, she wasn't surprised that Joanne and the group arrived, but it didn't seem like she knew that they were coming, you know, that exact morning. That That's how it seemed to play out. Um, yeah. Pete, this is, this is, it is what you all are talking about. so relevant to today because um, when you described Joanne as having that gravitas, it is because she's living in the present 
and dealing with the present. And Pat is trying to hold on to something from the past and it makes her less weighty. And it's the same thing that we were talking about, about the statues in Richmond. Um, the rumors of war is so powerful because it's dealing with today. And very interestingly, the, um, they've been, Richmond has been talking about the statues on, um, in, in Richmond, the Confederate statues giving them some context. Well, during all of the um, protests, the statues are now covered in graffiti mm -hmm. and they've got context. Mm -hmm. And the, then carrying that one step further, the three women from the Daughters of Confederacy have placed themselves at the base of the statue with their big machine guns. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, there are pats everywhere. Yeah. I, you know, but I, the I didn't... The Confederacy Monument was burned down. Yeah. As part of the protest. Yeah, um, I... I, I think when your idea of history is so narrow and so, um, in, I think, perceived as endangered, because I think that Pat, you know, from her perspective, this, the truth about Nathan Bedford Forrest was not being told. You, there seems to be an inverse, you know, the higher the sense of anxiety about that story not being told or your version of things not getting its hearing, the greater the sort of paranoia and the greater the verbosity that comes with it. One of the things that, in other words, you, you just, it's like you can't stop talking about it. One of the things that I think struck both of us, I mean, you cannot... Um, I'll throw the image up there if you want me to again. But one of the things you can't fail to notice about this forest monument is its novelty. Because it, it's, you know, the type's different. It's um, got full color rebel flag on it. You don't see that kind of thing on, on old monuments of an older generation, as it were. But it's also flanked by not one, but two big aluminum historical markers. Um, talking about Forrest, and it ends with, John did a great dramatic reading of this on site, which um, I'm tempted to share with you, but he, the, the, the end of the one plaque that's t telling the story of Nathan Forrest is about how at the end of his life, he gave his heart to Jesus. You know, he confessed to, invited Jesus to be his Lord and Savior or something. Um, which is also much more contemporary language. It's not kind of historical language from Forrest time, necessarily, uh, as much perhaps. But I, you have the sense like when a version of history um, becomes more contested and more um, dubious, it tends to present itself with greater and greater volume and more and more words. So uh, that is one sort of visual signifier that something was a little off here. And if I can chip in, Pete yeah. doesn't like to um, promote his own writing, but I, I do. I'm, all, <laughs> like, I'm okay with it. <laughs> he's got two excellent written reflections on, on what he's talking about and these symbols and kind of freezing a certain, um, this is the message you're gonna get about history instead of things that capture the complexity of it. So one, they're both on the website, The Birds of Marietta, um, and then the other was in, where was it originally published? LA Review, is that right? 
Yeah, the Lo Los Angeles yeah. Review of Books. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Flannery O'Connor's challenge to the... Oh, that one was in um, the Christian Century. Okay, gotcha. Um, tell me the name of that one. It's O'Connor's... Well, you know, they always, publishers Walker. always give you their own titles. I, I think it was like Flannery O'Connor's challenge to the myths of the lost cause or something like that. Yeah. But extended written reflections on, on exactly what you're talking about, Lucille, and um, highly recommended. Thanks. Pete, John did um, Pat talk more about uh, with the election of the mayor in 2000, that's when the plywood started or was it uh, in terms of decline of the town or was it that was in her version or in her understanding of the story, that's when the plywood started yeah. going up and, in Selma. Yeah. So was that, that was that. It was that explicit. Yeah, I mean, when, again, when I, because my initial question was sort of when did things start declining, assuming like, you know, even by the early 70s would have been probably likely, I'm just speculating. But for her, it was, there was no ambiguity. It's like around the year 2000. Mm, wow. So um, she didn't directly say it was because of the election of the African-American mayor. But I mean, in her own mind, that's, that's the it's cause and effect. Yeah. It was kind of a classic example of this sort of coded language. Like, it wasn't it was an indirect statement, but it was like one step away from an explicit recognition of the connection here. And by the way, you know, she learned on walking back from my, when John and I were kind of reunited after he had spent his alone time with Pat, and then we were walking back together to back to the Confederate circle. Um, she she had several other things to say about um, not just the, the election of the mayor, but um, more national poli politics. Yeah, that um, were also kind of examples of this sort of you know, not overtly racist in the sense that, you know, our president is African American, therefore he is X, Y, and Z. It was at one remove from that, maybe. Yeah, the, the, he was just stated to us, sort of like as a question, she's like, you know, Obama didn't really say the oath of office. And we were like, Say again? She's like, oh yeah, John Roberts left a, a, a word out or got a phrase wrong, so they had to redo it. She's like, and they redid it. Uh, you know, the public didn't see that one. He, he could have had his, he could have been, had his hand on the Koran for all I know. I don't know. But those were her yeah. comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There was one other moment which I'll share with you too that kind of speaks to this level of paranoia maybe, um, which was at the very end, right before, right before we were getting ready to sort of say our goodbyes the first time, um, I reached into my pocket for my phone and I was to take a picture and she sort of jumped back and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Have you been recording me this whole time? And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, but I should have been. <laughs> um, that would have been great. But I said, no, no, I just wanted to see if you would mind if I got a picture of you in front of your, you know, your pride and joy, because she had told us on that walk, you know, that the, the Nathan Forrest monument was her personal project so it was that was she was the engine behind that um 
and I think it just speaks again to this sort of subject that maybe I'd love to talk a little bit more about with everybody because I think this is something I've encountered, you know, it, it, a lot in myself and in, in uh, many others. Um, and Pat Godwin is kind of a caricature of this, maybe, but it's this instinct for defensiveness to um, double down on your position um, and to just not listen. And I think one of the things that um you know the this this kind of movement today that's that's promoting listening which i enthusiastically support um is i don't know if this is a white genetic thing or what but i think that i've, I've observed this both in in person in writings and in you know in lots of different venues this need to defend yourself that becomes kind of pathological and i think this is happening a great deal right now where we're being asked you know both as white people as um as southerners as whatever to confront honestly a history that is deeply unpleasant but also we are part of this this is our story and these are the you know the legacy of white supremacy that is our legacy everybody who's in this zoom right now that is our legacy and i think something that uh kesey lehman who's a uh, a writer from mississippi who um i commend to everyone pointed out something that really struck me yesterday and it was um i'll distill it in my own language i think one of the the thing one of the personal revelations for me that has been both exciting and really really challenging in this whole deeper south thing has been how little i know about my own self and how little i know about my own family history and how that Dix, I'm going to use a really, help me somebody here, I'm about to use a really academic turn of phrase and I want to, but the extent to which that lack of historical um, awareness is a luxury for me as a, as a child of, um, you know, I belong to a, 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 an affluent white male order of things. Um, and the thing that kind of struck me about Kesey comment is um, and I'll put this in terms of the Selma encounter. When Joanne Bland got off that bus um, I, f I think she carried herself clearly to me with a knowledge of who she is. She knows this history because it's not abstract. It is not a textbook. This is her history. This is Selma's history. This is something that she, I mean, I've, when I've tried to write about this, it's, it, I tried to describe her gait as carrying that personal historical burden 
just the way she walked. Um, and I think what the, the, for me, the Selma experience and the whole Deeper South experience has really illuminated how much white people like me can get along perfectly easily without ever knowing their own history and that knowing our own relationship to this legacy of white supremacy. We have the luxury of pretending like that or even not even caring about it, of it being an optional hobby for us. And to, bar to go back to Kesey Lehman's language, we don't know who we are. And insofar as, you know, we, I took that personally, because I mean, the, the sense of the we there being, you know, uh, the white kind of establishment. Um, that hasn't, that has done no one any favors. Like, no one benefits from a, a kind of willful obliviousness to the past. In fact, everybody suffers from it. Um, so wait, I'm gonna end my homily there for, for now. If I can, if I can yeah. make a follow up to Pete's comment, um, there's, this is a question from Meredith on the chat that I, I do want to um, address. Can, I'll, I'll, can y'all see the question? Should I read it? Okay. Read it. Um, okay. Meredith's question says, it's so easy for us educated white people to make Pat the problem and she is. But in what ways, because of our own individual blindness and cultural norms, it's disappeared. Pete, sorry, where did? Oh, did I? Just Meredith's question. Okay. Uh, Can you see it now? Is that, is that visible? In what ways, because of our own in? Oh wait, in what yeah. ways? Be because of our own individual blindness and cultural norms at play, are we actively involved in perpetrating the same disapproval of blackness as Pat? Yeah, and so just to, um, <clears throat> that question in relation to this story, so I mean, I, I, to me, the story symbolically expresses that, that there's no neutrality. So we've got like, in their own persons, and they're, you know, they're, they're based on the same age, Pat and Joanne, symbolize and stand for different things. So there's not a neutral position. And, and literally in the story itself, there was no way we could just be witnesses, right? With, with just the, the showdown that we saw. I mean, we were witnesses. We couldn't just be witnesses. Um, <clears throat> if we just got in the van and driven away, the group would have assumed we're with Pat, right? I mean, they would have had every reason to assume that. So there is no neutrality. But then the second thing I want to say is, is that does, and this is what Pete was talking about, is it gets more complicated because all white people are complicit in the problem. <laughs> I mean, we're, and, and so there, there, there's not an easy way and you say, oh, well, I don't have any ties in any of this history. I don't live in the society, you know, I'm just, we're with Joanne, we're not with Pat. That, that's a false position and we, we would, you know, there's no way, to, you know, you get, I mean, there's, there's no neutrality at the same time. There's no exemption from the society that we're trying to not be neutral about. Um, so I think those, yeah, I mean, in any of the storytelling I'm doing, if I get animated, I'm trying to capture Pat as she actually was telling things to us. I'm not trying to, um, you know, poke fun at her or, or demean her. We don't agree with her position, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, Meredith, your point is taken. Um, I, I, I do hear that. Yeah, and I, I just would, em, you know, emphasize too that I don't want to make Pat a kind of caricature or an easy target because it's it, the that you know it makes this whole thing the white supremacy 
that's somebody that's something other you know it's like um it's the dudes with white white sheets and hoods. yeah that's like if you, that's all that's it you know right and i mean we could talk about this later but i had a specific moment the first time i read ta-nehisi coates about my response to his use of the term white supremacy was exactly that was i felt well that's that's people in hoods you know and i've seen you know i've seen clansmen in hoods and so i've I, I can say well that that's not that's not me um and I think, you know, sorry, did Sam, did you have a hand up there? Yeah, I was just, just going to have, have a thought about the whole kind of privilege of looking back at history um, that, you know, I'm, I'm in somewhat of a similar journey with going back to my family and doing the same Grew up in North Georgia and Dalton and, uh, you know, fifth or sixth generation uh, Daltonian or, uh, or Lantern and, and learning kind of the, the goods and the bads, not just the story of the positive. Um, and sat down with a, a couple last week who my mom graduated high school with, uh, who uh, desegregated 11th grade for them, so they graduated high school together, but it's a prominent African-American couple, and just kind of learning the history. And they, she remembered her mom telling um, her about the lynch, the last lynching that happened in Dalton uh, downtown, and she viscerally, viscerally remembered that. And mom, my mom has no memory of that ever happening. Um, so that, that kind of juxtaposition. But what I wanted to kind of say was, um, even the going back and looking and finding records of my family after I've been so not, uh, you know, ignorant to it all before is a privilege as well, because so many of my black friends, there are no records <laughs> they, unless they were sold. Um, and then there may be a record. Um, and so that like, there's two sides of that privilege that I'm kind of seeing now. It's like the privilege to not know and then the privilege to know once I want to know right. uh, that that really uh, jars me. Sam, I don't know if you're here when we were talking about, um, I think I may have mentioned this in Michael Twitty's book, The Cooking Gene, where he's, he's a, he kind of is attempting to do this and he's, you know, he's trying to, he's African American who is trying to trace his, his own, and it's about the DNA as it were of American food, but it's also about his own DNA and is trying to find like where he comes from. And, you know, at some point it, the records just stop and he has to, he has to attempt to reconstruct some sort of genealogical lineage through paper sales receipts for his own ancestors. And so, you know, I have, the, you know, I don't have to do that. That's a, that's fortunately a lot of the stuff is written down. But you're absolutely right. Like the the ability to trace your family history is a, a privilege of of you know of right of of whiteness in some ways. It also I think enables you because the work has already been done sometimes to just not care about it. Like well I know it's there on the shelf. I've got a book over there that's got like all this, and like I know somebody did that hard work for me. And I can conveniently leave it to one side and never really um, internalize it, as it were. It's amazing, too, how one, one's identity formation will, uh, um, will cover up part of one's history and bring another part of that history to light in terms of one's uh, family makeup. Uh, our family has uh, a good bit of Cherokee, but that's something that's been kept. It, it's kind of been acknowledged every so often throughout my childhood as some kind of exotic bit of us. But but what really is li was lifted up and what really we as a family grabbed a hold of was definitely the white element. So I'm, I mean, culturally, I'm definitely white. And it's amazing how even after years of having African-American brothers and sisters teach you about their own stories and this history, you still find are always digging that stuff up. I'm thinking particularly, I was a, a, a chaplain in Kansas City 
for a few years and had a, a, a couple of brothers that were friends there, African-American brothers, who had been raised Christian, I think, and then later in their life came back around to their Christian faith. But in the meantime, before do, making that turn, they had, uh, one had been with the Nation of Islam, was a driver for Louis Farrakhan. Uh, the other had been with the nation for a while and also with the Black Panthers and now brought still a great appreciation for those experiences and what they learned there back into the Christian faith. And you have times like this where those people deeply form you. But, you know, a few years later, when I'm in D.C. doing doctoral work, I was walking down the street and my family is from a poor enough background to where we were also taught to be a bit fearful of the police too, a little bit in, in my hometown, uh, just cause you're poor, uh, kind of white trash thing. Uh, but I found myself one day walking down the street in DC and being surprised, I think by a couple of police officers that came, came up and I was startled for a second. But then it just viscerally hit me. I can relax because I'm white. Mm. And it just made me relax. And you like to believe that that stuff is still has all been uncovered. But it's, I mean, I don't want to say that racism is as deep as the image of God in us. I think that's a problem. But, but I, I think it's much easier to start from the assumption that, that I'm racist and allow the transformation to take place from there rather than trying to defend myself because I'm just not overtly racist because there's a million little microaggressions that mm -hmm. I'm sure I engage in. I think that's well said. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, there's a lot to respond to. I don't know that I want to um try to hit hit everything but, but um one thing i do want to throw out there is um just looking at the time here for a second um the i i, I, I want to throw in this theme from the selma story and it is um these young students i think i'm old enough to call them young um who i'm afraid, I'm afraid we are pete yeah um but uh you know meredith told me the other day that the person who filmed the george floyd murder and who was, you know, telling the cops to, to stop doing this, get off, was like 17. And these young people, and, you know, that was a pretty gutsy thing to come up to Live Oak Cemetery in front of the Nathan Bedford Forest Monument and stand there and indulge the president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And I want to, at the moment I was, I found myself really kind of blown away by, at their self-control and like at their level of non plusness about, because there was a little bit at the beginning where it started to look like this was going to be the Pat Godwin show. And she started to tell her version of Forrest and you know they they just did not take the bait and um they were also incredibly gracious to me and john i mean i'm one of the things that really like sticks with me kind of emotionally is is their their sense of goodwill and that that and joanne's too and the the but the, the guy who we first saw as we were getting ready to leave, I think John made a comment to him out the window because he was at the edge of Confederate Circle and he was wearing a t-shirt that had Emmett 
it was a black t-shirt and white letters, Emmett, you know, Eric, Michael, Trayvon. And there are a lot of good reasons for him to be suspicious of us and not and give us the time of day. And I was encouraged, like, I guess I'm encouraged, just maybe more ashamed <laughs> is the right word, um, humbled by these young people's sense of poise and um, I, I think courage is the right word and, and, and warmth um, that that's a feels like to me a, a, an encouraging um, sign, but I didn't want to let that one go. Yeah. On I'm mind. glad you brought that detail. I think I said something really clunky and ridiculous. Like I like your shirt. I, it's not something like that. I just wanted to convey that I, empathy and uh he nodded and smiled a little bit that's when he walked over and i said are y'all like a school group or something like that that's how we got in the conversation about it uh it turned out his name was elijah which added to the just kind of mystical sense of everything that we were um taking in and then he proceeded to like follow us on instagram <laughs> for the rest of the tour so, but yeah, the, the, not just from Joanne, but from the students as well, this, this uh, hospitality and openness that, yeah, for them and for, I mean, for Joanne, but certainly for them, took, takes a lot of courage because there's no reason they should be <laughs> assuming we're people of goodwill based on what they'd seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Brent. So I, just before I ask this question, I want to be clear. Joanne brought these kids to look at the Confederate stuff. Okay. So this is just something I hadn't really thought through because when it comes to Confederate monuments and the removal from public spaces, and um, and there's certainly a lot in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, where I'm at. I've always kind of said, yeah, let's let's remove them, but I haven't really thought about kind of neck steps and um, I guess I appreciate the preservation of history and all that but it just it strikes me that while the irony that while this is a a space that's meant to commemorate and celebrate the lost cause it's also an opportunity for more visionary teachers like Joanne to come and actually <laughs> kind of do their thing too. And um, I don't know what I think of that. I'm just kind of observing the irony. Have you, have you guys, I know, I know John, I've talked to you some about monuments and what's, what's happened in Augusta and stuff like that, but you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I would say whether we're talking about, you know, 1868, 1877, 1950, or, or the year 2000 with the Forest Monument, the monuments were never just, oh, let's honor these, these, these soldiers, these generals, right? They were never just that. Um, they were political statements. And again, in the showdown that we witnessed, no one needed to be told that there, there were political statements. Um, but I think like with, 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 it was very important to Joanne that the monument had been moved to a cemetery. There was a lot of symbolism there. Um, and it was a teaching lesson, so it wasn't like just thrown in the river or whatever, but it, but it was a lesson that it had been moved. Um, so like here in Augusta, there's a massive monument to the, you know, right on the main street that went up in 1878, basically the overthrow of Reconstruction, that um, I think if it was moved to the cemetery here, that also would be a very symbolic object lesson. You could, you know, do what Joanne was doing with the, with the forest monument. Um, yeah, I mean, we can talk more about this, I guess, I mean, in person, but those, those are initial thoughts. Yeah, and I'd add my recollection of that exchange with Joanne was that they never 
you know, Joanne and Rose Sanders, who's also a, a veteran of Selma. The woman who hates white people, right? That yeah. was what we had been told about her, right? I think her husband is a, is a long time representative in the state legislature. Um, and from them, the way it was told to us was, you know, they never, they never said the UDC can't have this monument. Like you, they're, they just said, you can have your forest monument if you want it, but you can't put it on city property and you're not going to put it in the middle of Selma. You can put it in the, you know, the Confederate cemetery where it belongs. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I think every time we have this conversation, I, I have a different idea about it, like, you know, but it certainly in this case, it became the occasion for an extraordinary kind of reckoning almost. I've been amazed by some brothers and sisters in the African American uh, portion of the church who are just like I have a problem with fear. I, I, I deal with anxiety, depression, and you know I have a history of dealing with fear. And I remember my friend Larry, uh, African American brother, he was coming home to my hometown with me one year from college and he was going to sing at my dad's church. He's a, he's a gorgeous vocalist. And, and I, and I was remembering stories like the fact that, I mean, we, we didn't really have a lot of African-American folk where I'm from growing up. It was just a poor small town and there's nobody lived there, but, but I had heard the stories about us around the year 1900 running a black family out of town. And I knew there was a lot of overt racism there. And I, and before we went, I said, Larry, you know, I can't guarantee that there may not be things, things said to you uh, out on the streets in my town. And he just looked at me and smiled. And he, he calls me cooter sometimes because of being from the small town South, you know, and uh, he said, he's like, cooter. He said, I have come too far and Jesus has protected me too long for me to not trust him. He said, I, I am happy to go and just smile and beam. And I thought, man, I, I don't know. That kind of witness is just, yeah. Another thing, I, a question I had, if you guys wouldn't mind, if you know of any resources, whether it's essays or books that can kind of, that go into the development of hot times in, in history when these monuments have put up, been put up, because I know it's been, it seems like it's times in the decades and years after the Civil War when these monuments will be put up in places. And I, if, I wonder, John, Pete, or anybody, if you have any resources that we could go, where you could point us to. Yeah, Gregory, I'll, uh, I'll drop a list and I'll just email you um, or send you a Facebook message directly with that if, it, if that works. But yeah, I, I can write up a list. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I just, I thought it was interesting, Lucille's commentary on uh, how one person was living in the present and one person was in the past. And Pat is obviously living in the past and it's, you all have already talked around it, but it was, I just couldn't get away from the fact that her, her most prized possession in life is in a cemetery and what belongs in the cemetery other than things that are dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's well put. Heritage also about belongs that. in yep. the cemetery. And Sorry. that's what she got. Yeah. I say heritage also belongs in the cemetery. And that's what she's valuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just an in, in kind of editorial thing to, to both those comments. This is in Pete's um, reflection on Claire O'Connor thinking about the lost cause. But but the lost cause, it's, and this will be in some of the books, I'll send you Gregory. Um, the lost cause itself packaged a certain version 
of Confederate history, of the Civil War. It, it was curated and packaged for political reasons. It wasn't, let's tell the raw, messy truth of all of it. It wasn't that at all. It was, it was a carefully packaged, curated version. And so in this great Flannery O'Connor story, late encounter with the enemy, there's this general, he doesn't remember what battle he fought at, but he's a general, you know, da, da, da. it's in you know, the early 50s, set in the early 1950s. And he just sort of rides the coattails of the lost cause because he's so and so general and fought, he was wounded somewhere, da, da, da. He's, he's got prestige in the community. And in the kind of climactic moment of the story, he has this flashback of, of basically like real history, like the raw, messy, violent, real history. And I won't give away what happens in the story, but it doesn't end well for him. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you know anything about Flannery Lost O'Connor. Lost Cause packaged version versus the real raw messiness of all of it. Yeah. And I mean, let's, the one thing we might say about this contextualization um, theme, which is, you know, part of the, one of the sets of ideas that people have about around what to do with these Confederate monuments is that contextualization has been going on for a hundred years around the lost cause. If you go, as last time I was there, I mean, I'm sure it's still there because these things never move, but I was at the state capitol in Atlanta. And if you go in the entrance, you used to have to walk pat, right past a statue of Thomas Watson who maybe we can talk about another time. But you, on either side of this, the big staircase that goes up to the main entrance of the state capitol are four big plaques that talk about the siege of Atlanta in 64. And they were put there by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1920, 100 years ago and it's still there. So what that is, is a contextualization of what this building you're about to enter represents and the terms you are expected to accept its authority on. So, wow. I mean, and there are all kinds of other statues around the state capitol we could talk about besides these plaques. I'll give you one more example about the contextualization thing and the sort of re-narration of history that we um, encountered in Memphis. There's a corner in Memphis where there are two plaques to Nathan Bedford Forrest, and they tell completely different versions of things. One is the old Lost Cause version, put there by the UDC, or at least I'm sure sponsored by it. The other one is a more recent one that gives a much fuller picture. And um, while well, acknowledging that we'll never have the, the full picture, um, I think that's one of the things we're about is putting those fragments back together and something that resembles um, a whole little bit more. I um, Just yeah. real quick, did you show the photographs of um, Pat and Joanne? I was lost in my story. I didn't I, know. I did not, but um, let me see if I can find those real quick. I'm gonna have to duck out here in a moment, um, but I did want you. This is um, so. I'll just share real quickly. This is this is Joanne. Um, this is Joanne on the the. Can y'all see? Yeah, and that was last last summer. Um, in a, the visit we had with her. And the, this is one of John's photographs of um, the cemetery. I mean, it is an extraordinarily beautiful place. Like it hits yeah. all the, the usual um, buttons. Um, and then one more. Oh yeah. Um, I want to say a little bit about this one. Okay. Um, I actually have to duck out. Maybe I should save this for later. Um, the, but. I will save them. So you just come Okay, good. So, okay. I do have a, I've, 
don't tell anybody, but I'm supposed to get my hair cut today. It's, <laughs> but I think it's, I think it's legal in North Carolina. Um, so this last little piece, um, I don't know if you can see this. While, while John was, was with Pat Godwin uh, at the beginning, I kind of stumbled upon this little piece of paper that was sitting on the ground. And I don't know if you can read it, but it is a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper flyer that is an invitation to attend Confederate Memorial Day commemoration in Live Oak Cemetery uh, on April 26, 2018, 6 p.m. That's Confederate Memorial Day, still a state holiday in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, hosted by the UDC, etc. And then it's list a couple of the names, but um, it ends with the. <coughs> Uh, these three lines, be proud of your Southern heritage, honor your Confederate ancestors, and bring your lawn chairs and a friend. Um, <laughs> but, so here's what's weird about this, okay? So, that flyer is from the Confederate history, uh, the Confederate Memorial Celebration on April 26th look at it. I mean, I don't know if you got to see it. It's almost flawless. It's a little crumpled. Well, that's a clean sheet of paper. We were there in July 2018. May, June. Three months, Alabama summer, you know, and this sheet of paper just sort of happens to be sitting on the on the ground in perfect condition. And I don't know of any piece of paper that can survive three months in Alabama without nary a raindrop, a speck of dust, you know, heat, sun faded, nothing. So just to add a little bit of entry to the, um, the whole story. Uh, I started to wonder whether or not these were like, these were put there as a kind of message. Uh, they were sort of, you know, accidentally left around. Um, there was one other episode which, um, you know, which I'll leave out, but it which happened around the, the confrontation of the, the two the group with, um, um, with Pat that kind of made me think that too. But um, it was a bizarre little detail that I think I only thought about later when I looked at the date on this thing and was like, how, how did that get there? So um, maybe another contextualization perhaps, uh, or attempt. Um, okay, so let me see if I got all the photographs that we wanted to see. Um, I think we did. If you want me to um, share those with you or you, you'd like to see them um, up close, I'll, uh, I'd be happy to do that. I also... John has mentioned a, a set of readings about Confederate monuments for, for Greg, and I've been thinking about this for quite a while, but I feel a new sort of need for this maybe is to put, put together a kind of deeper salve bookshelf type of thing that would have um, a set of, you know, a list of readings maybe of the books that have, have really impacted me. Um, and I can get John's contributions to that too. His will probably be a lot longer than mine. Um, but he, he wrote a, well, a certain essay called Wither the Southern Tradition. Yeah, we're not, no, that, that, that one no longer exists. Yeah, that's a subject for another time, but um, we will get there. Um, 
Anybody else have any final thoughts before I go? Duck out. I just thank want to you. thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks for tuning in. Thank the you, last Edward. word, yeah. I'm sorry, Pete, the last word on the, uh, or John, the last word on the monument, Deo Vincere, what is it? Vindice. Vindice? Vindice or Vindice, yeah. Great, thank God you. God as our vindicator or defender. And, and that, that was, was on the Confederacy's official seal. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's a bold statement. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have one small tidbit um, I never reflected on. We adopted a dog when I was 10 years old and it was named Bedford after that general. And I never wow. ever uh, was concerned about that until I learned about the history of him a year, a couple of years ago. But uh, we renamed him fortunately, but we had a name Bedford for after the general. Well, I'm curious, what did you rename the dog? <laughs> Fetch it because it's a golden retriever. So much more appropriate. Better. Hey, I'm sorry. I got to add one thing. If Sam's going to go there, yeah. Um, so our third son. Once you get to three, you start to get desperate for names. And um, looking through our family tree, um, we name our first our first son after a couple family names. And my grandfather's father was uh, Tillman. <laughs> So we thought we thought John Tillman Drigger sounded really point of fact contextually it sounds really good. It just rolls off the tongue, John Tillman Driggers. And then son of South Carolina ignorantly realizes that my great grandfather was probably named after Ben Pitchfork Tillman, the notorious white supremacist and um, racist. <laughs> Senator from South Carolina. So we're trying to we're trying to redeem the name Tillman. It's kind of part of how we don't know our own history, even at the most personal level sometimes. Yeah. Hopefully that ties in. Oh definitely. I did not know that story. Pitchfork Tillman. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody. I mean, on a on a really dark day, um, I feel like you all brought a lot of light into my life, and I'm I'm grateful for this conversation and for your presence here and and for your honesty and your willing to be your willingness to be a part of this and be be frank and and all that. And I hope we'll do it again. In fact, Please. one week from today, one week from today, I'll be back here at 12 with Natalie Channon and Roseanne Cash, which I think is going to be pretty cool. Um, and then the week after that will be John and me again. Uh, the 23rd will be, we'll have Michael W. Twitty here. I've already mentioned him. He's the author of The Cooking Gene, which is a book I highly recommend. Um, on the 30th, Susan Neiman, philosopher who, um, who lives in Berlin, uh, written a book called Learning from the Germans, sort of tying together the lost cause and German memory after World War II. And then finally, uh, the 14th of July, We'll have Scott Peacock here, uh, great, the biscuit master. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, about biscuits and a lot of other stuff. We're gonna eat biscuits. We'll all come back for all those and, um, and uh, tell your friends. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And Thank I'll you. hope to see you all in one week. Thanks everyone, good seeing you. Thank you, John.